everybody. Next day, part four of the Bare Bones project and a beginning uh, steps into art journaling. And just a reminder what this project is all about. This project is, is not about creating a journal full of finished beautiful pieces. This project is about taking the first steps into finding a confidence in yourself, a voice that will give everything a go, no matter what happens, and a way of stepping out of the critic. So just a quick recap. We did some splat prints, which are a, tot a totally letting go process. You can't control where the paint is gonna go. We did some splat prints on some watercolor paper, that's in part, uh, two, where we created um, these watercolour sheets which we then uh, stitched together to create a little book. Last session, part three, we explored um, looking around our house and finding some repeat marks that are all around the home. And the reason we did that is because one of the common phrases in art journaling when you're looking at layers, which is what art journaling is all about, is this thing called mark making. So um, on the video a journaler might say, I'm just going to make some marks. And actually the marks hold the whole piece together even though you don't necessarily see them first because they are the background and the backdrop to most of your pieces. So we've got a library of um, marks that are our own that we've um, found on, in our home or on a walk. Um, quite often when I go on holiday, one of the things that I'll do is I'll keep my eye out for little repeat patterns everywhere and they become my marks in my holiday journal. So we've done that and today is going to feel a bit like a launch forward before we take a launch back and the reason is is that if you're anything like me you're itching to get a, uh, a piece going and one of the um, brilliant ways to create a piece fairly quickly I don't want you guys to start rushing at all is to use uh, ephemera or bits and pieces of paper and books and um, mailings that you might get through the post to construct a piece um, so I've got on my table here a few products that I want to introduce you to because um, also doing um, art journaling with ephemera is going to ask you to use some products and much as I want to make the bare bones project very cheap and very easy for anybody to access, there is some products that you need. So I'm going to show you the papers that I've got first. Um, and I suggest, you know, in the UK we've got charity shops, I think in uh, the USA you've got thrift stores, I'm sure there's all sorts of things all over the world, um, places where people chuck stuff. This is a lovely book that I found in my local charity shop, it's got pictures of flowers in it, and um, what was great when I found it yesterday is I realised that in between some of the pages are these lovely little bits of, of tissue paper. Um, so they're really good, I shall certainly be using some of those. Um, this is a piece of wrapping paper, you saw me take some mark making inspiration from wrapping paper yesterday, so I definitely have a huge vat of that. Magazines, um, if you're not a magazine buyer, I certainly am not, and this is certainly not my type of magazine at all, I'm not a fashion girl at all. But um, if you, you know, go on to a Facebook page that you're on and just ask if anybody else has got any old magazines, save them from land waste. Because actually, one of the key elements that we're going to do today is use the face of somebody to construct a piece. Or of course, if you don't want to use magazines and you want to use your face, you can do that. But we are going to do a similar project later on, if you bear with me. Okay, so um, books paper. Um, this is another thing I always do. I have a plastic bag in my art supplies cupboard and anytime there's an interesting article in a newspaper or some interesting pictures I just cut them out and I stick them in there and then that's kind of my um, 
my little pack of, of go-to things that I can grab. Okay, so other products. Um, you can't see here, but I've got all of my paints out on my table because I want to be able to grab them. And I just wanted to kind of backtrack a little bit. When we did the um, splat prints on the watercolour paper, one of the reasons that we used acrylic paint and not watercolour paint, I know some of you have asked, is because when you then add water on top of, so say you'd done the bottom layer in watercolour paint, if you then started to paint on top of it using uh, any water-based product, the watercolour paint underneath would re, re, um, re splurge <laughs> that's a technical word for you, would reignite and start moving again. And we don't want that. We want that background to stay the same. And acrylic paint, because it's got a plastic in it, will always stay the same. Once it's dry, you can't move it again. So it's there for life, whatever we put on top of it. Okay, so I've got all my paints everywhere. I've got my pen pot. Um, this has got Posca pens in it, gel pens, a, um, alcohol markers. It's got all sorts of bits in there, so I've got that to hand. And the other products that we're going to use today that I want you to um, get a hold of if you can is some gesso. So this is some white gesso. Here it is. There's my white gesso. So some thick white gesso. This is a, um, get yourself a decent brand. The, the cheap ones tend to be very, very translucent. And really the reason why we're going to use gesso, we want it nice and thick. And I'll talk you through the purpose of gesso when we use it. So gesso. Then I want a different gesso, which is a clear gesso. So this one, when it dries, um, goes clear. And this is a brilliant product for putting on top of collage or papers so that you can then write on top of it. Because if you've ever tried to write on top of um, a magazine page, you'll notice that some of the paint and some of the pens don't actually go on it. And that's because it's got a shiny surface to it. Adding clear gesso will um, take that shiny surface away and let you play. Okay, and the final product, if I can just lean forward and grab it, is gel medium, which this pot is, uh, is almost run out, so I need to get some more, but some gel medium. Um, this I use instead of glue. You can use PVA glue if you want. That's the UK people, PVA glue is the white glue. Or um, I think you guys in America, you have Mod Podge. So either of those will work as well. I prefer gel medium because it's archival, it won't yellow with age, uh, and it dries so much quicker than anything else. And you can get a fairly cheap quality of this because um, we're not working on canvas, we're working on paper, so a cheap quality um, gel medium will work. I've got my paint brushes. Um, that's me for now. You probably don't want to hear me talk much more. I want you to have fun with this. I don't want you to let that critic win if it starts telling you you can't do it. We are going step by step by step, really slowly. You absolutely can do this and you absolutely will create some beautiful pieces that I would love to see. And once again, once you've watched, if you want to post your pictures up onto the Earth page, please do. Please leave any feedback that you want to below. That's always a great, uh, a lovely thing to read as well. So if you, uh, if you look below this video, you'll see in the um, description box a link to my Facebook page, which you're welcome to join and see me live every now and then. But for now, I'm going to head you over to the table and we'll talk about what we're going to do. So welcome back to the table. Welcome back to your journal and welcome back to mine. Um, I just wanted to take just a quick minute and explain why I use art journaling um, as well as alongside being a psychotherapist and one of the reasons that I do it is because with art journaling as opposed to art, um, art journaling is all about the process that you go through, it's never about the end result. The end result is a, is a lovely bit that you arrive to but the journaling of itself the layers upon layers are where you begin to understand more and more about yourself and more and more about the world around you and about the the fun of using different products 
And I want you to keep that in mind while you're doing this piece today. I want you to keep in mind that I want you to discover things as you go. I certainly will, and once I do discover those things, I'll share them with you. Um, I want you to discover things, and I want you to let that guide you. And don't be tempted to be too controlling over your piece. Don't try and push it into a direction that perhaps it doesn't want to go. So we're going to open up this book, and remember, we're going to leave this front cover till right at the end. And... Um, We've got our pages that we did yesterday. It's extremely bright in here today. I have to say it's not something that I'm very used to in the UK. Uh, normally I've got my lamp over my shoulder. Today we've just got the sunshine, which is lovely. Okay, so I arrive at these two pages. And um, what I want to do is I want to be able to use as many of these pages as possible along the Bare Bones project uh, as double spreads. So I've got orange on one hand and green on the other, which you know presents me with a with a dilemma straight away because we've got two completely different sides. And this is where your mark making comes into play because the mark making is going to allow these two pages to meet each other um, with a common a common thread. So I'm going to look back onto my mark making and I'm going to choose perhaps two. That I really like. Now as I said uh, yesterday, I really like these, these kind of screws. I love these screw heads and I really love these little flowers here and I quite like this detail here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this up here because that's my kind of longest uh, pattern and I'm going to use a pen, let's have a look in my pot, find a pen that I haven't lost the lid to, that's always fun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a blue um, Posca, this is a new one, so I'm just going to get that one going. Just having a scribble with some of these... Uh, markers at the same time and working out which ones I haven't run the ink out of. Okay, right, so the blue is ready. So let's check back. I've got a curvy line along the top and I'm going to put that straight onto my piece. So those of you who already do art journaling might be wondering about the gesso that I've got out. Um, and I will come back and explain that in a minute. Okay, so now we've got this line. And then we've got another line underneath that. And then we've got these big, come back, these circles here. And I tend not to be overly careful and precious when I'm doing my mark making. Like so. And then we had, I think, some little circles within the circles. So I'm going to do those as well. Okay, and we might come back and play with those. So the next thing is these screws. And I keep flicking backwards and forwards because I wanted to see the different styles I did them in and I really liked the softness of using a Posca pen. So we had a circle with a line and another circle.
So one of the other little tiny rules, I'm going to put one so it's just coming off the page here, is to never just do one. Don't just have one one little mark. Have it have it somewhere else as well. Everything likes a friend. Okay, and the last one is these little um, these little florets, and I really loved using the large Posca pen for these. So what I'm hoping you're beginning to see on my page and certainly on your own page when you do this is how quickly these two completely opposing colours, the orange side and the green side, are starting to make friends a little bit. And um, I'm going to get the same blue actually that I used for up here and just do some little clusters of smaller ones of these as well. I mean, the first thing I'm discovering, I had no idea that this Posca is actually metallic and in the sunshine, it's, it's shimmering, which is really sweet. I actually really like that. So that's the first thing that I'm discovering along the way. And also something about this being a bit like a garden. Okay, so um, I'm, I may or may not have to move the table in a minute. It is extremely bright and I know it might be quite tricky for you guys to be seeing, but let's carry on with the light as it is for now. Um, so I've put my little mark making on and this up here, I'm probably going to use and do something with it and incorporate in it later. I'll just bring that down so you can actually see it. This is the first mark making that I've um, made and um, all of these little things here. And it just, it just is already sort of saying to me about a garden. Um, I love discovering that these Posca pens were metallic and uh, I might say something about something shimmering. I'm loving these shapes over here where the white, um, where the paint splatters haven't quite gone on there. So I might do something with that, but now we're going to talk about some products and we're going to start using our papers. So the first thing is your gel medium. Now if you're going to use gel medium on big amounts of paper then I suggest you using a credit card or an old gift card to spread things. Obviously not a credit card that you're still using. Um, however, if you're just using a small bit, then just, you know, have a brush that is devoted to gel medium. It does get quite um, sticky and quite gluey. So after you've used a brush for gel medium, I want you to go ahead and pop it in some, um, some warm water with a little bit of washing up liquid and that will clean that for you. So um, I'm going to get out some of my bits of paper. I've got this lovely bit of uh, wrapping paper which is already quite shiny. I genuinely did not get this all out because of the fact that it was shiny. However, I'm not going to know it may have influenced my choices. Um, so I'm going to have that out and I'm going to use this um, Oxford Book of Flowers and I'm going to come to some prints that may be um, quite cool and I've got this tissue paper that I discovered in here as well which I want to use and there's some really old newspaper clippings in here these I think are really fun so some of that as well and let's have a look in here and see if we can find what I want to do is find a nice big blue Ah, there we go, look, blue and pink prints. 
that's very nice as well blue and pink oh there look that's lovely okay let's use that and maybe a page of script or oh, maybe there's orange oh it's hard to decide okay um i'll tell you why i'm choosing certain colors what what you'll notice is that i'm choosing this color here because it um is similar to here and these blues and pinks are similar to here and i'm thinking that um whatever i choose to do i could put this on the opposite page just again to help it come in and I actually, you know, I like this as my second choice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start ripping some bits and pieces up. I want some main pieces which are going to be in the front. I want some pieces that are just going to be um, another layer in the background. Um, so I'm going to start with the background pieces and these you tear. And I'm going to get my gel medium out. And mine's already got a credit card or an old gift card in there. So, um, just tearing some little pieces. So, I'm um, just checking them on the screen. Yep, so just... Put some gel medium down, stick your piece of paper on, and I always like to go just a little bit over the edge. And then what you're going to do is get your card with a bit more gel medium on it and just go over the top of it. And the reason that you do that is it helps all those edges just to sit down properly where you want them to be. Okay, we can tear another piece of paper here. Oh, we really have got a lot of shadow and shading on here, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pause the camera, I'm going to move myself, and then we're going to start again. Welcome back. Quick shuffle round. I think you'll agree you can see much better. <laughs> I'm so sorry for the, uh, the, the uh, painful eyes as I was working in such bright sunlight. I'd wanted to take the most of it and uh, it's just too bright for videoing in. So we're back again and um, what we're doing is we're just now using uh, strips of, of ephemera, old paper, whatever you can find um, to again add to this background. And we're, we're always mindful that what we're wanting to do is just lay out the background. This does not need to be some beautiful, ordered little thing. I'm just wanting to place paper and paint in a way that it starts to create a backdrop for whatever main thing is going to go on the front. Now, something that I didn't do with this piece of paper because I forgot myself, but I have to say, when I'm using text uh, on a background, I tend to always have it upside down or to the side. And the reason that I do that is I don't necessarily want people to be looking and reading the words. I want it just to be something that um, appears. And the other tiny little rule that I, I tend to explain to my groups is um, the eye really enjoys things to be either horizontal horizontal, or vertical. So when you're sticking your paper down, try not to do any diagonals. We've got enough chaos in the background. We don't need to add more chaos to our eyes by um, putting di diagonal bits of paper down. So just one way or the other. I really like that and I've got one little tiny piece left that I'm going to use as a as a piece just to overlap like that. Okay, so that's our little bits of paper down. I've got this, this shiny stuff now which I really like. This is a wrapping paper. 
you know, it's well worth when you're in town just just popping in and seeing what they've got. Okay, so I'm not really giving much thought, if I'm honest, to where I'm placing these bits and pieces or what I'm needing them to represent or anything like that. I'm just, just layering them up. Layering. So let me speak for a minute then. And you can already start to see that what's happening is that all these different elements, our mark making, our repeat mark making, and our placement of papers is really starting to help bring these two completely different pieces of um, artwork together. Okay, now gel medium dries really quickly and that's brilliant. What it's not great for doing for at least a good 24 hours is drawing on the top of it, unless you dry it with a heat gun. And I'm, I guess, a little bit of a stickler with people who are beginning with art journaling, saying to them, allow it to dry naturally. And one of the reasons is that when you're doing art journaling, you've got several layers. And if you keep drying with a heat gun, two things are gonna happen. Firstly, the top layer is going to be dry, but everything else underneath is going to start to warp and crinkle and your pages are going to start to all buckle. Some people like that. Um, for this particular project, I'm not too keen on doing that. The other thing that's going to happen is any paint that you put over the top of these things after you dry them with a heat gun quickly is, is more susceptible to cracking because the product hasn't dried quite right. Now, because it's a nice sunny day here in England, and because that's very lucky, if I put this outside, I reckon in about half an hour, it will be fully dry. If you're indoors, if it's a damp day, if it's cold, you will need to leave this overnight. Um, I'm gonna add some of this um, brownie tissue paper here as well. I'm just remembering that I've got that there. Um, and it's quite dark. Um, but I think that that will add some really nice um, contrast to the bright colours that I've got down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let that dry in the sun and then I'm going to come back and uh, do, some, do some more collage. Come back to the piece and the glue has dried and actually this had much longer um, than just 20 minutes in the sun. This uh, actually had a couple of days because um, other things got in the way, as is often happens with creativity, I think. Um, so the piece is lovely and dry. <clears throat> We've got a few little bits here that didn't stick down, but actually I'm going to leave that. That's fine by me. And as promised, we're going to do a little bit more collage. Um, but before we do that, before we start sticking um, what I like to call surface collage or, or um, points of interest or focal points, sometimes they're called, <clears throat> what we need to do is we need to look at these little bits of paper that we've stuck down and we need to help them hide a little bit into the background. Now, of course, the easiest way to do that would be to paint over them. We don't want to do that because we want to keep what we've got and allow it to be part of the background, but um, we don't want it to be part of the foreground. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use paint and colour uh, to start to allow that all to sit back. And we're going to do that two ways. One is by using paint, 
and I've got um, a green paint to match the green that we've got on this side and I've got an orange paint which will uh, match the oranges on this side. I've got my big pot here of Posca pens um, and other such pens and we can um, obviously recreate some of these little repeat patterns that we did. And the other thing that I've brought to the table is some watercolours. And I've got um, a watercolour pot here. This would be absolutely fine to use, and I'll show you how to use that. Um, this is a lovely little tower that, that stacks on top of each other. They're relatively cheap. Um, and then the other thing that I've got are um, these lovely, lovely um, Neo colours, which quite a lot of people use. They are well worth the investment, but if you can't afford a whole tin, then um, you can buy these individually in art stores uh, and you can certainly in the UK there's a website that you can buy these from where they're £1.85 each um, and you can get those delivered. And so I want to talk about um, how I'm going to use these after I've put some paint down. Um, so that's that. So the final thing that I, I want to grab hold of is some gesso, um, both the clear, the clear variety, here's the clear, and a white gesso. Um, and I'm going to show you how we're going to use those. Um, I tend to use a fairly good quality um, gesso just because then it's nice and thick and white. But, you know, start, start from where you're at. Don't go and spend lots and lots of money unless you're sure this is something you're going to enjoy. Okay, so let's start with, um, we've got our, I always use my board. I'm, I'm a, you know, I hate using pallets because you have to wash them up. So if you don't have a plastic board, perhaps grab yourself a, um, a bit of uh, baking paper or parchment paper. That always makes a great uh, substitute for a uh, drawing board. Okay, so then a bit of this green. like that and I'm putting this on the board because I have to say I'm mainly going to use my fingers to work with and then I'm going to get this gesso out and I'm going to put a big blob of that as well. Now I have got to hand <laughs> some, some uh, kitchen roll just to give myself a bit of a a scrub down in between. Okay, that's all done. So, how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to randomly choose some bits and pieces that I just don't necessarily need to see the edges. And I'm going to use my finger to sort of smudge that out. Now, um, if I show you a bit of a close-up here, what you can see is that I'm not, I'm not making this um, completely thick so that you can't see anything. You can see a bit of the text. It's there. Um, I've sort of smudged it out with my finger enough that you can see it, but I'm just softening around some of the edges. Now, some of it I, I don't want to. Definitely this very dark here is very prominent. Use your eyes. If something is really, really jumping out at you at this stage, really that needs to be to be uh, muted out a bit, and Gesso will do that for you. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with the way that that is. I'm happy that I've got, um, you know, that muted back. But obviously, what we've now got is lots of splodgy um, white mess. And we want to um, make sure that this is not splodgy white mess, that it kind of ties in. So what I'm going to do now is in some of the areas, again, not all of them, some of them I don't mind a little bit of white over them because it, it kind of looks like a mist. 
And as I said to you at the beginning, you know, this piece is, to, is speaking garden to me. Uh, it, it might, you know, your piece will say something different to you, but equally, I think a nice sort of hazy mist over a piece actually softens it all down. So I won't get rid of all of it, but I'm going to use in exactly the same way, using my fingers, I'm just going to use this green and orange to go over some of those areas where I've just put the gesso. And again, doing it nice and gently with your finger, not with a paintbrush, in order that it can um, create a soft edge around some of these bits. Okay, so what you can hopefully see um, is in, in putting that gesso around some of the edges, in adding some colour, these bits of ephemera, bits of paper, have begun to um, step back out of being a focal point or a focus point and they've started to become part of the structure. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a tiny hint of green to this page and a tiny hint of uh, the orange to this page to begin um, accompanying the two pages. So they, they start to harmonise with each other rather than clashing against each other. And then after I've done that, uh, I'm going to let it dry and then I'm going to add some watercolour and we're going to use a contrast colour to really start to make these two pages sing before we add our final pieces and, and a little bit of text. So I'm just going to, like I said, just add a very small hint of orange over here and a very hint of green. And the easiest way to do that, the most simplest way, is to just use your fingers to create little circles. Okay, just a, um, a very quick point. Allow, make sure when you do this project that you really um, allow colours to dry. Mine, this orange, I knew would dry very quickly, which is why I could put the green straight on top. But ordinarily, actually, green and orange would make a fairly horrendous brown. But in allowing that, that green, that orange that I've put over the top of that gesso to dry a little bit, means that I can then start adding these extra colours. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow this to dry and then I'm going to come back and add some watercolour. So I'm back and my paint is dry and it's really important actually that it is properly dry before you um, tackle what I'm going to suggest you do next. And the reason is because, um, if you remember I said before, we've done the background and these little bits here in acrylic paint because acrylic has a plasticity to it. And so once it's dry, you can't then add paper to it, uh, paint, uh, water, I'll find the right word. You can't add water to it and make it run. Um, and we're going to have a go at using some watercolours now to add a little bit of contrast to everything that we've done and give it a bit of a pop. Now, what do I mean by contrast? Well, um, I'm going to put the li a link below this particular video to a very simple colour wheel that you can print off. And in fact, you could stick this in your book somewhere so that you've got it as a reference. Um, the colour wheel is a really useful um, 
gift really to avoid you heading into areas where colours aren't going to sit very nicely with each other. And there is a little tiny rule of thumb, there's a few little rules when you're using a colour wheel. One is that when you begin drawing, should you wish to follow a colour wheel, the patterns that they go in is either a triangle like so, where the three colours are next to each other, and they will always go with each other. So that's the number one rule. I'm just going to bring this in so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, the number two rule, which I'm going to use pink for, is that the colours create a windmill with each other. Um, so the windmill is, for instance, let's have a go. Let's see, we've got pink on this windmill. Then one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we've got a windmill. Those colours will also go with each other. Pink, yellow, blue. Now then the other side to this is that you can use these three colours here and the colour that is opposite it as your contrast colour. So that's all going to sound like a bit of gobbledygook at the moment, but I'm going to, we're going to refer to this every single time we do a piece, and you will get used to it, I absolutely promise you. And if not, you know what, go and look in your wardrobe and work out clothes that go together and clothes that don't, and that will tell you the colours too. So I'm going to look at my colour wheel, and I know that I've got uh, this green here, which is a very green green, but I've also got some blues in it that I've added. So I'm kind of here. And then I've got orange, which is right over there. So at the moment, I know that I've got this bluey green here. I know that I've used some blue in the background. So I know I've got those two. I know that I've used some yellowy green here. So my, my uh, orangey red over here shouldn't work at all because it's not within those rules that we've done. So instead, the way that I can do it is like a windmill. I can imagine that this bottom colour is my blue-green. And then I can go. One, two, three, four, and I arrive at the orange that we've used. And then I can go one, two, three, four, and that tells me that my third colour needs to be in the mauves. Okay, so what we worked out there, that the, the colour rules that I've used don't work if we do the rule of um, the triangle being together and the colour opposite, because in fact we should end up with pink. So instead we've used the rule of threes. We've got the blue-green, the orange, and now we've got a mauve. Okay. So either you're going to gather your watercolours like this, or you're going to gather your watercolours like this. And I'm going to pick my mauve. So I've got a mauve there, and I've got a mauve there. And I'm going to choose which one that I want to use. They are both different. I think I'm going to use this kind of more... Oh, let's have a think. I'm going to use this darker one, I think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a fairly thick line just underneath some of my um, bits of paper like that, just, just giving them a bit of a, a highlight. going to let that one run over onto the other page as well just to help tie those two in and a little bit down here as well. Okay then I'm going to grab a brush and I've got here my tin that I allow all my dirty paper to be in, my dirty paper, my dirty water. And I've got a brush, a, a jar here with clear water in it. And my 
um, kitchen paper to hand to. So I'm just going to pick up some water from this brush. I'm not going to dry it. I'm just letting it rest on here so it doesn't all drip all over my page. And then I'm going to put some very wet, a very watery layer of water over this purple um, that we've put here. Okay. And then I'm just going to lift my page up. And let those drips begin to travel. Okay, not too far. I don't need to have enormous drips. And then I'm just going back over all of that, just giving it a bit of a tap with my brush. So that what I don't have is a very thin bit and then very thick blobby bits. Okay, so again, lots. And then the final thing is while this is still a bit watery and a bit wet, I'm just going to take my crayon again, rub it into where the water is and just reaffirm that original line that we drew because by now it will have all been diluted in the water and I just want to recapture it and make sure it's still there. Okay, so what I want you to do now is um, these little circles of colour that we plopped on up. So we picked up the colour that was on this side and we put some dots of that colour on the opposite side and we did the same thing the other way. And I want to um, really help them kind of pop. Now this word pop, what does that mean? Make it sing, make it shine, like you. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make you shine and sing so that you don't hide your, your creative juices underneath a, a bushel. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take... If I can find, so it's always where you least expect it to be. It was right behind me. So <laughs> I'm going to take this and uh, I'm going to zoom in on an area so that you can see what I'm doing. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm go just going to literally take my black pen and add some little scribbly circles around those little dots. Now if you've ended up doing loads, you know, if they're all over your page, don't be tempted to do it to all of them, just do them to a few. Um, but I think what you start to see is this thing that people really like when they look at art journaling, which is this, this idea of contrast and texture. And our piece is starting to have some form. all of them yeah fab okay so while you've been doing that your watercolor has really had a chance to dry uh, however I'm just going to get my my little cloth here and I'm just going to go along it and just let it have a dry and this will also help it pale down it's not so bright and I am really enjoying that purple and how it's helped those pieces come together. I think it's a little bit like heather in a garden. Okay, so now let's talk about um, the focal point and how we're going to draw all this together and how we're going to create a something from it. Now, as I said, there's a point along this process where you might arrive and start thinking, 
oh, that looks like a, it could be a garden, or, oh, that's a cave, or, um, oh, that, that's a bit like the forest that I used to walk in when I was a child. That's brilliant. If you've got that idea, just write it down on a piece of paper and park it until you arrive at this stage. And this stage is the kind of point where we can go, right, what are you, what are you wanting to be? And I still am attached to the idea of it being a garden. I still love this kind of brightness of the green and the uh, bright orange. It reminds me of those really dark sunflowers. So I really like that. And I, I think I'm going to go with that. So I'm going to grab a pencil. Uh, this is just a standard um, soft 2B pencil. And I'm going to write with pencil, not with pen, and, and specifically with pencil because we want this to still be part of the background, really. I'm going to start writing a few words that um, link the theme of garden to me. So emotions, um, memories, maybe, um, all sorts of things that remind me of garden. Just in pencil. So I've just popped down some words there. I've got serenity, playful, daydream, warmth, bursting, weeding, seeding, sunshine. Okay, so those words are now going to kind of help me construct the next part. And that is that we're all going to put a figure on here. Um, and you can, if you want, at this stage, use a picture of yourself if you want to. I'm going to do that a little bit later because I want to do um, a project with you later on that is all about using your own face and um, adding it to a piece. Um, so what I've got here is um, an L magazine, um, but you can use any magazine really, a gardening magazine would have done for this, anything. And I want to find a character, a face that represents all these words um, for me. And I had a little cheat earlier and I found some pictures that um, I could use. Um, I really like this one. This one I'm pretty sure is gonna be the one that I get stuck with. Um, this one is really nice. I liked the idea of having something black and white against all of this very bright color. Um, She's very stark, but I thought that, you know, there's something about her that was quite bird-like, almost. And, of course, this lady completely represents serenity for me. Um, so, I'm going to grab some scissors. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this lady. I'm going to trust myself. <laughs> and... We, whenever you're using magazine articles um, or pictures, I want you to always know that it's okay for you to make this your own. So you could just cut this out and stick it on if you wanted to. However, it would be nice to make this girl represent something of you. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to... her sort of here. I want to take off her hair a little bit. Uh, if any of you have heard of a, of a journaling artist called Tisha Moore, um, I just think she's amazing and um, she has a really good step-by-step -step, um, make your own journal program that is free on YouTube that you can access. Um, and she's really good at sort of teaching how to use figures in your work. But we're going to start like that. And actually what I'm going to do is bring her back a bit. Just to that. So that looks a bit scary now, doesn't it? <laughs> and I want to place her in the middle and use my um, gel medium as the glue. To j 
just pop her on the middle like so. Put her on, at least get her straight. Like so. And then, as before, I'm going to use a bit of gel medium around the edge just so she absolutely definitely stays put in my journal and just smooth that out like so and then what I'm going to do while that's you know all drying and everything else is I'm going to get some gesso and we want to make sure that our figure doesn't hide into the background a bit like you I don't want you to be hiding your talents so I'm going to take a brush and some gesso and I'm just going to come round the outside of this face with, with some gesso and you can see I'm putting it on fairly thick and I'm not worrying about spreading it out yet but we will And of course your figure is going to represent whatever you want her to represent you know maybe she's going to be like we said if your picture reminds you of a cave maybe she'll be a cave person or maybe she'll be an animal okay so now what I'm going to do is take my trusty finger and just not right up close to her but just take these you know they take the thickness of the um, gesso and start to spread it out so that it almost creates like a halo around your figure and this is going to do two things it's going to allow you to start adding the, the hair that you want her to have and it's also going to make her stand out Okay, now while all of that is drying, we can get our pencil again, and I want you to create her dress. So her, her neck here, she's going to have shoulders, and don't worry if you're not brilliant at drawing. Don't, really, really don't worry. It, it, this is your first kind of... Um, picture. I'm certainly not brilliant at drawing. I play more than I'm than anything else. Because actually the pur purpose of this is more that I want you to give her a very long cape or a frock. So we're not going to need to put arms in. and what's brilliant about doing this with the pencil I love to have multiple lines all around my figure like this to add sort of movement and texture and then we're going to find that gesso again and we're going to put a layer of gesso all the way over where her cape is going to be. Now, if you are really kind of getting stressed out with drawing the figure of her cape, if you're really worried, then, you know, go on, go on the internet and download a picture of a cape. Make sure it's the right size to match your figure and have a template. That's, you know, totally allowed. Okay. And I'm also gonna put some gesso just around that neckline like this. And 
like that. Okay, so the fun is truly about to start. You're going to have so much fun with the next bit. I can't, um, I can't wait to see what you do. Um, I really like when I'm doing my figures. I really like there to be this white halo, which is the gesso around the head, and I really like, as I said before, this kind of pencil um, dark line to be around the body. And so I just kind of really, after I put the gesso in, just go around that again with my pencil, just, just allowing it to really, um, really pop. We want that figure to really pop. Okay. So we're going to need to leave that to dry. It, it's going to take, you know, a good few, a good, a good couple of hours or so. Um, and again, like I said, you can get your heat gun out at this point if you want to. You can give it a dry with your heat gun. That's absolutely fine. I prefer to let my um, gesso dry with, with natural air just to absolutely, definitely get a really lovely, um, solid, dry area. So I'm going to do that. And then I will come back later and show you what the final stages are of completing your piece, which will include adding some hair to your figure and will include putting something into this gown here because, of course, we don't want her to look like a ghost. <laughs> That's not the idea and it certainly isn't very garden-like for me. So um, anyhow, I'm going to uh, let that dry and I'll come back to you. Hello and welcome back to our first big project. Um, for you it's not such a welcome back because you only just stopped watching from uh, when I was just painting this gesso on but I've left my gesso overnight to really dry so it's nice and um, solid and we're able to work on it without um, creating um, bumps or without sort of um, diluting the gesso. It really does need a good time to dry. I just wanted to take um, a couple of minutes just to recap what we've done with the project with this piece of paper so far. So we had our background ready made. We then added some strips of ephemera and paper and we let that dry. We added those with um, gel medium and we made sure that we were adding those either horizontally or vertically. Once those were dry, um, we added some um, paint using the um, Neo colours, which we then just diluted so that that gave us just a little undercurrent. Uh, and then we found the head of this person and we've added a cloak. Now, I, I sort of went away after having done this thinking I ought to talk a little bit more about the cloak shape. Um, essentially, when I draw a cloak, it's a very wide upside down U that comes behind her neck. And it really is the first easiest way to create a body onto a person. It means that you don't have to include arms. It means that you don't have to include a lot of shape. And it just gives you this, this wide shape that actually what we're going to do today is we're going to write in there after we've added a little bit of colour. Um, we also put some um, gesso just around her head here just to um, sort of illuminate it a little bit so it stands out. And we will also be using um, some pens just to give her a little bit of hair. Um, and the other thing um, that I've got here, I don't know if you remember right from early on, um, we tore out these pages of these flowers and I want to incorporate them somehow into my piece. I'm probably just going to sort of stick them down um, along the back of her dress just to really turn this into the garden piece that we want it to be. Um, so I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get on straight away with adding a little bit of colour to her cloak because then that can dry in time for us to come back. And what I wanted to use is um, to use the purple... The same purple actually that we used 
to draw the lines in the background of here. So I'm going to get hold of that, that's this, the Neo colour, and I'm going to go around mainly the edge of the cloak like that and I'm not being overly careful because I'm going to dilute all of this okay so mainly around the edge like so and then also along the bottom so she looks a bit like a bell at the moment okay and then I'm going to get a brush. I quite like to use quite a firm brush when I'm using these Neo colours. Um, it really picks up all the granules or all the colour pigment from the crayon, like so. And just do one bit at a time because what I'm wanting you to do is bring those colour pigments into the middle of the gesso so that that pastel colour, that purple colour, sorry, just um, starts to come into the centre of the cloak. Can you see that? So I'm just, you know, using this brush, and like I said, if you use a nice hard brush, it will really pick up those the crayon pigments so that what you won't be ending up with is little scratchy lines. And as I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm actually reminded of a bluebell shape or a crocus shape. Okay. So I'm going to let that have a little bit of um, drying time to itself. Um, while I move on and uh, cut out my flowers and stick them here. And I'm going to use the orange um, flowers because I think that they will go really well onto um, this green background to contrast with the orange that we had on the other side. really kind of now ties in um, you know actually when I stuck it down what I really um, hadn't realized before is that this that this plant was green and that this plant was orange and yet they were on the same page so actually um, it's worked really really well um, so she's still drying a little bit you can see here we've still got splodges of paint and you can move that around a bit with your finger if you want to which is really nice um, while it's still a little bit damp I'm going to go in with my um, crayon and just around these edges, not around the bottom, just around these edges, I'm just going to um, tie that in. And um, when, you, when you've got a wet background and you're adding these, it's a bit like um, putting lipstick on. <laughs> it's quite, uh, quite soft. So I'm just going to put that in there because that just helps to create a little bit of a shadow line around the outside of her dress like so okay so hair let's uh let's zoom out a bit and uh, come up to her hair um posca pen for definite you're going to need that 
Uh, you're also going to need a, a slightly finer pen. Um, I've got a green here as well. You can't see any of those because I'm not putting them out. <laughs> so I've got a black Posca. I've got a green um, permanent pen. I've got a black permanent pen. I've got a pink Posca here. What else have I got? I've got a gel pen. And I've got one of my favourite pencils, which is a charcoal pencil. Um, these are absolutely brilliant to use um, with um, mixed media and art journaling. So let's have a look at her and let's decide what we're going to do with her hair. Uh, and I'm going to start um, with my charcoal pencil. And what I want you to do when you're doing your hair is just play. Make sure that you also go over the face. Um, let's zoom in so you can see. You know, don't, um, don't just have it start in here and coming out. You know, that's not where our hair starts. Yeah, you're, you're turning this um, figure into one of your own creations. And I want her, actually her hair to look like she's sort of being blown in the wind. Okay, so I'm just sort of taking that out. I might wrap that around the flowers, actually. That looks quite fun. But she's quite a, quite wild. Don't be too pretty with hair. You know, if, you, if you've been out all day, actually, your hair doesn't just flop down in a perfect way. Okay, so she's got mad hair at the moment. So now I'm going to get my uh, black Posca pen out. And I'm going to come in and do some things with that. I'm going to make it very dark by her neck and then sort of come out a bit this would be you know sort of your shadow line underneath your hair and then come out and don't worry she's not going to have mad crazy bat witch hair all the time, which you might do, yours might decide to have mad witch hair <laughs> and that would be okay too. Okay, again, shadow right down by her neck, it's sort of a little triangle down here where it's normally a bit darker. And I really am sort of just scribbling at the moment, I'm not... Um, I'm not being terribly careful about her hair. Sort of finding a finding a flow really. Discovering where it's gonna end up. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to get some uh, colour and some paint on there and we're going to go back to using our fingers again. So um, I think I will probably go for, hmm, probably like a yellowy colour I think. Okay, so what I've actually chosen is a gold and a brown and these two are going to be my hair and I'm going to use my fingers to paint it. And the black that we've put down there, um, you know, it, it, because it's Posca pen and because I've got charcoal underneath, it will lift. Posca pen, unless you buy an acrylic Posca pen, is not, um, so it's not permanent. It is water soluble, so it will move and that will create even more shadow. 
So I'm going to start with the brown and I'm just going to put a plop like I always do on my board. And using my finger to sort of trace the lines that we made with the Posca pen. Okay, so I've got the um, I've got all the dark brown there, and um, now I'm going to go in with my gold, um, and I am going to use a brush for this. And what I want you to do to start off with is to think about where the central point of her hair is going to be, and mine is going to be here. Okay, so I'm going to have lines that are going to come like that and I'm going to have a line that comes like that. And then this here is going to be fringe. So fringe is kind of easy, you just want to put your straight lines down like that. Okay, and don't be, don't be worried about... Um, you know, getting all your other paint involved and blending because that's what we want. Okay, so then I'm going to get my um, my new colour, my gold, and I'm going to, from that middle point, draw lines using my paintbrush. Okay, and then just to soften everything up, you're going to get your finger and just pat along those lines a little bit. Okay, now the hair is kind of done now, apart from the fact that once it's all dry, I'll use a white Posca pen to add even more highlights to it so that it doesn't look like a mop on her head, so that it, it actually like, looks like hair. Um, I just want to sort of come in around the edges of here where there's this darker area underneath the hairline. Like so. And under there. But now what I want to do is I want to construct a narrative to this piece. Now the thing with art journaling is, is that, that um, you generally have some form of words going along um, and this is now ready for those words and you've got a number of options. Um, something that's really quite fun is to draw lines and then to write on your lines. Another thing that you can do is just to write random words in there. Or another thing to do is to attempt to write a piece of poetry if you want to. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the thing I love the most, which is just to draw some, just to draw some lines and some words um, that will link something about being in the garden. And, um, so I hope you'll bear with me. I'm going to speed through the process um, and the last few final bits and pieces to show you what I do. Um, and then I'll come back and we'll just have a quick chat about uh, what went on. And I'm hoping that I will get to see you have a go at constructing your very first piece.
So I hope that um, you've come to the end of your um, piece. Maybe you've created one as well alongside me. There are things that I'm happy about. There are things that I'm not happy about. There are things that I would adjust. Um, I'm not yet happy about the hair. I may have to pale that down with some yellow paint. But I actually think um, as far as where I want to go with this for this particular project, I've actually um, reached the point where I finished today. And it's perhaps quite a big jump to imagine yourself going from beginner to creating a person. Um, and part of the reason why I've left this quite rough and ready is because I really want you to have a go at just playing and just experiencing without having to get things perfect um, and allowing process to begin to emerge. And you can see through the journey that I went through creating my mark making on the background, matching up the two completely different opposing pages using the marks and, and contrasting colours and then the construction of a very very basic person um, just with a cape and with hair that we've used predominantly our fingers to get the background colours in and then pieced every bit every other piece. I really love this little lark hidden in amongst her hair and I really like the contrast of dark and light on here. Um, I perhaps don't like that I've covered up so much of the background. I think it would have been nice to see a little bit more of that. But you know what? Process is what process is. And she tended to, to become quite big, quite larger than life. Perhaps a little bit like me, I think. <laughs> so um, that's it for today's journey, um, for today's part of the bare bones. I really hope you'll have a go. I really hope that you will allow yourself to make mistakes and to grow and to discover whatever your piece wants to tell you. Um, but that's it for today. Tomorrow is a brand new day and a brand new start for me and some space. Yay! Some space to play. So um, I hope you'll join me then and uh, carry on with this. As I said, don't forget to join the Earth page to post up any of your process shots or just comment below and let me know if you've got any questions. I really look forward to uh, seeing your pieces and hearing how you get on with the Bare Bones project. See you soon. Bye.